Assalamu alaikum everyone and welcome to the Umarpreneur podcast where I bring to you Muslim entrepreneurs from various different industries to share their experiences with you and really their knowledge and the impact that they're making. And today I have with me Sister Zainab Tariq from Serial Box Agency. Assalamu alaikum Zainab, welcome to the podcast. Wa alaikum assalam, thank you so much for having us. It's a pleasure to have you here and I'm so excited to dive into this discussion. But before we do, I would like to get a little bit of background on the entrepreneur themselves. Can you share with me a little bit more about yourself as an entrepreneur, your background, how you even gravitated towards entrepreneurship? What did that look like? Cool. So a little bit of background to me. So I was born in London, but raised in Saudi Arabia. And I was like kind of lived between Jeddah and London my entire life. So I had a very like internationally diverse perspective, went to an international school as well. Hence the confused accent that dips in and out of uh, every continent. Um, so that was pretty much my childhood. Uh, I never knew what I wanted to do growing up I always do that whatever I had to do had to be rooted in social good I knew I had to put more good back into the universe than I took from it and that was kind of my north star growing up I came to London for my A-levels and officially moved here for that and then completed an undergraduate degree at King's College in international development mm-hmm. and then it was great I learned a lot about the world and the way it looked and understood like what efforts were being made in the space to make things better but uh, after all this pessimism I decided that it was important to start focusing on solutions I always had a hand in like charities and doing like freelance work for them as well as marketing the two completely different ends of the spectrum and uh, I decided to see what it is that mainstream academia was saying about how to run non-profits effectively Mm-hmm. So I did my postgrad in nonprofit management at Cass Business School. And then COVID struck, which is kind of where the serial box journey began. Mm-hmm. So COVID hit. And at the time, me and my partner, Jamal, uh, the other co-founder and CEO of Serial Box, we noticed that a lot of the clients we were working with, we were just doing like freelance work with some random marketing agency. And we noticed that some of the clients uh, that were approaching us were now charities because the way that they were marketing was still quite traditional comparative to like the for-profit sector. So billboards and like bus ads and stuff were not going to work during COVID. Mm -hmm. So we kind of were given this client and I was the charity girl who who had studied extensively uh, how charities work. And we were given this, this client to just do something with. So that was the COVID Ramadan. We tested out a really random strategy from like the humble sanctuary of like a kitchen table. And alhamdulillah, it worked very, very well. We had one of the biggest ROIs we'd ever seen. And suddenly we realized we're onto something. There is something very, very surreal about seeing numbers go up like that, especially in the last 10 nights. And we realized that the Muslim charity sector was not monopolizing or making use of the digital marketing space at all. Mm -hmm. So we're like, cool, let's start Serial Box. And Serial Box was actually an inside joke between Jamal and I, because we're we're cousins too. (laughs) And uh, we were raised together too. So it was a kind of like an inside joke we both had. And the name got set very serious very quickly, probably too quickly. (laughs) And um, yeah, and then we were kind of spread among the Muslim charity space in London. And we were suddenly sitting in an office with a couple of employees and clients and things skyrocketed from there, alhamdulillah. Amazing, mashallah. I'm really happy to see your success. And obviously, it's in a sector that has amazing impact. So it's beautiful to see what you've been able to do. And I'm curious, you mentioned Serial Box, inside joke. What is that? Can we get a little bit of insight on this? <laughs> um, so Jamal and I have li- literally been working together since we were kids, whether it was like lemonade stands or even as we got older, we used to pull each other into like sales jobs. Um, mm-hmm. So we were always each other's right hand man. And uh, one of our things we had in common is we both were big cereal addicts. We, we really liked cereal. So whether it was like, uh, despite how like childish or like sugary the cereal was, uh, we were always a huge enthusiast of it. And we just thought it would, it would make a really funny name uh, and a very memorable one too. And I think we were right because that's one of the first things that people remember about us. And they're like, oh, cereal box, that's interesting. So what are you, what do you do? So hundred percent. I like, it. and it's it's interesting because it, it is very clever and catchy, right? And I, your design even on your website, it's like you're using like the little milk cartons and like the, the boxes <laughs> you really took advantage of it and i can see like the marketing background in that for sure um and so 
one thing I want to ask you is, you know, when you were going through your studies, did you, did you know, or did you plan to start your own agency or did it just happen as you saw the potential and then you naturally, naturally gravitated towards it? So what was fascinating was that in my undergrad, I did not think that I did not put two and two together. I didn't think there was a space for digital marketing charity. A lot of what I was focused on was like long-term structural development and policies and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But then when I looked at the way charities were functioning um, on a more micro level, I realized that there were so many small things that they were left out of the loop of, especially when it comes to conversations around technology and going digital. And when I was doing my under my postgraduate degree, there was only one slide for the entire year. And this is like one of the best universities in London. It's one of the best business schools here. And they were the only university that was specializing in charity effectiveness as, as, a, as a sector to study in. And there was only one slideshow that was not even entire like like presentation, just one slide that was like, oh, and you can, you can do some digital marketing, but nobody knew what it was. Mm. And even looking around the room, I was the youngest person by about maybe a decade. Oh, okay. So, uh, yeah, so it was it was wild to see that they were, so many of the like the, main, the mainstream academics who were supposed to be the best in the business had no idea what the potential of digital marketing could be for a lot of these charities. Mm -hmm. So uh, that after coming to that realization and then having the opportunity to like test out a strategy and really see if it works, that it, it all stars aligned it made sense. <laughs> all right. So then you had to, it sounds like you had to go and kind of self-educate on how to really run effective digital marketing campaigns because the college that you were at didn't give you that education. Is that correct? Yeah. So luckily I always had like a first like hand. I used to do a lot of freelance work for different agencies, whether it was the one that Jamal was part of or additional ones. Um, I did a lot of like consulting on my own as well for some brands too. So a lot of it was ad hoc learning. And the thing mm -hmm. is with digital marketing is you don't need a degree or to study at some fancy university to understand the ins and outs of it. What's cool about it is that it's still evolving and we're learning more stuff about it every day. And the best mm -hmm. place to learn that is at its very source uh, online. Everything yeah. we've learned has been online. For sure. So I'm going to ask you a bit of a controversial question right now. It's going to put you on mm -hmm. the spot. Even though I told you I won't put you on the spot before we press record, but I guess I have to. <laughs> <laughs> All right. uh, but looking back right now at what you're doing, right, and where you're at, and exactly what you're saying, you're like, you know, I, I took this entire program on business and marketing, and like they didn't even touch on digital marketing, which is one of the biggest booming sectors right now. Looking back, would you still do that again? Would you still go through those years of college or would you just go straight to learning digital marketing and, and launching your agency? If you could do have I it think over. If I would do it exactly the same way. I feel like the insight that that postgraduate degree gave me, gave me the confidence to know where charities were lacking. Mm -hmm. The purpose of me completing the undergraduate, de the postgraduate degree in the first place was to understand what the best way is to run a nonprofit and in the most effective way. Because we know that there's a lot of flaws and plot holes in the way they're currently working. So my intention to start the degree was to do that, but instead it revealed more about what they're not doing than what they are doing. And had I not had that exposure to the best of the best supposedly in the sector, I wouldn't have come to such a strong and justified conclusion that this is what the sector needs. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting way to look at it. And what, what, in your opinion, are the biggest mistakes right now that nonprofits are making that you're seeing out there and maybe the potentials and opportunities that they're not tapping into? I think a lot of the industry is focused on wrong, as not wrong, but skewed aspects of of fundraising um, we still see a lot of like a while events and traditional marketing and leaflets and all of that stuff have their place i think utilizing opportunities online would really show charities how they can extend the lifetime value of a donor as well as monopolize of very cheap ways to market I'll give you an example. One, one of the things we always push for ch charities is to create user generated content. So charities will spend a lot of money producing really, really beautiful cinematic pieces that communicate need and urgency abroad. But really and truly, that need is so far distant and so far removed and detached from a giver that that's not something they can relate to. Mm -hmm. When it comes to giving charity or trying to sell the idea of giving charity, what you're really selling is a feeling, an emotion. Mm -hmm. 
so it's more there's more there's more like basis or like there's more chance of conversion when you're demonstrating what transformation looks like as opposed of as opposed to creating performative content the idea is you want to create transformative content and the best way to do that is to show what the end result looks like a piece to like of me just looking at my phone and talking to the camera we found that ads like that do so well comparative to the really expensive high budget cinematic pieces and it's frustrating but there's there's opportunity there yeah definitely it's an interesting perspective and why do you think that why do you think why do you think that is that advertisements because a lot of people think well if i wanted to advertise my business i wanted to go marketing well i need to have like this really awesome dslr camera i need to have like the lights i need to have the the edits and as you mentioned and that's something that we've realized in our own marketing as well is that you know the the ads that we run where it's just like me in a cell phone is yeah. usually performs better than the ones where like it's me in the studio and it's like super well shot why do you think that is well i think it's because the way we look at social media is changing I always say that if something feels performative, people are going to recognize it. People can now recognize what dishonesty or not, not that you're not, you're being dishonest, but they can sense what some, when someone is being disingenuous or something doesn't feel so organic. It's, mm. it's, it's very transparent through a screen. And because we're exposed to so much content on a daily basis, it's, becomes very repetitive and performative and what you want to do is to create things that feel real because that's what really activates donors and helps people like like you said for yourself your own podcast helps them really connect with your core message and purpose because mm -hmm. it, we're suddenly on the same level i don't need mm -hmm. to be in front of a dslr mm -hmm. and for you as an entrepreneur and agency owner if we shift the conversation there a little bit because this podcast has a lot of listeners who are starting their own businesses growing their own businesses mm -hmm. For you, what has been the biggest realization in your own business to grow your agency? What do you feel like you went in with in terms of bias that eventually realized, well, this wasn't true and this is how it actually is? Um, well, from an Islamic perspective, one of the things that me and Jamal realized from the very start is that keeping our intentions pure was the mo and reaffirming what our intentions are from the very start is is the basis of most of our success alhamdulillah like we've raised over 35 million pounds for charities so far and not we can't attribute any of that to ourselves all of that is from allah because from no matter how hard it is to stick by principles or to become flexible and bend the rules for different clients no matter how big they are if you stick to making sure your intentions are pure and you're doing with it within the guidelines of Islam, Allah put barakah it. And I think we really saw the fruits of that when we had to make compromises and turn down contracts um, just purely because it didn't align with our Islamic values. So I think that was the biggest like learning curve for us is making sure that we stick to our inherent values. Um, and then I think more professionally, one of the things that surprised us was probably the way the Muslim Ummah interacts with other businesses. I think we realized pretty soon that there was this mentality of give us discounts and do us a favor. But really and truly, if we want our Ummah to succeed, we really should be wanting to pay extra or do more or go above and beyond to support each other. Um, so that was a really interesting realization socially too for us mm. that uh, there was this there wasn't as much support as we thought they that they, we assumed there would be yeah it's it's a, that's something I actually talking about on my instagram one of the re, it's i had filmed the real day like what subhanallah and, and it's i know there's a lot of people that agree with you because that is really like one of the only reels, reels that went like extremely viral which was a video of me essentially sharing uh, on Instagram, some people like, look, I challenge you the next time you work with a Muslim business, instead of asking for a discount, ask if you can pay them more so that you can support other Muslims, right? As they're you know going through that process of starting their own businesses, becoming entrepreneurs. Uh, and it's so important because it's only when, it's, when, we, when we support each other, really, that we can grow as a community. And I want to know for you personally, Zainab, what is it that drives you in business and in life? What is it that keeps you pushing forward and that has you aiming higher and higher as you progress? I think I kind of touched on this 
touched on this in the start when I was like the I knew from a young age I didn't know what I what I wanted to do all my siblings went into medicine I didn't like blood so my father was like okay you're not going to be a doctor you have to be the president and I was like well Baba, that's that's not gonna happen <laughs> so, um, so I think for me knowing that I am contributing to something bigger than myself and I'm doing something to put more good back into the earth has always been my driving force behind anything I do mm-hmm. like numbers on a screen and stuff they too, do tend to seem abstract but one of the things that always motivated me and Jamal was when we when we've done a campaign and we've raised all the money and now it's with the clients and they're all happy uh, they always come back to us with like videos of this aid being distributed or this home being built or this orphanage being like refurbished and that feeling I think is unmatched knowing that you've played a part in making making like another child's life a little bit more easier or mm-hmm. housing a, a widow or whatever the cause is. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Well, it's cool because you're in an industry right now where you can tangibly see that impact, which is really awesome that you're working with nonprofits who are out there on the ground doing this. Um, a lot of people don't have that opportunity and so they have to th- dig deeper and, and really look at themselves and their business and really question, well, how can I impact this person's life in a positive way? Even if it's something as simple as like, you know what, this little item that I'm selling or this this little service that I'm providing is going to help improve their life marginally yeah. or exponentially, right? Now, I want to know for you because entrepreneurship for a lot of people is glamorized, right? And a lot of people kind of see the bells and whistles and like the, the really cool part of it and the freedom and like the yeah. lifestyle, uh, which sure is, it's awesome. But a lot of people don't see like the inner battles, that go on right the inner like yeah. self-talk that you're going through the inner arguments with yourself when there's one side of you that's like this is really hard and i kind of want to like i'm thinking about giving up and then there's another side of you that's like no we have to keep going and our mission is bigger than this and i want to know for you what is it that you do to keep your mindset in a positive state what is it that you do to kind of remain on the path and remain fearless and positive in your journey well, like you said, it, it's never easy. Uh, you, it is highly glamorized and people tend to not see the the daily struggles or how in most jobs you check out or you walk away, you close the office door and it's gone. When you're an entrepreneur, like I'm sure you know, it stays with you. You carry that stress with you that you're not going to meet targets and goals yeah. wherever you go. I think the most important thing is having a supportive team. Mm-hmm. Um, my co-founder and I, one of the things, mashallah, that we have is balance. When one of us is freaking out, the other one is logical and vice versa. So having a team that is able to understand how to reciprocate when things are stressful is super important. So I say choose who's who's around you. And uh, I think above all is patience, just trusting that Allah has a divine plan for us and a journey for each one of us. There were times when Jamal and I were like, yeah, I, I don't know how we're going to get more clients. I don't know how we're going to make it to the end of the month. Or, But subhanAllah, there is always a solution. And if you keep your intentions pure, Allah will make that journey easy for you. And if it's not easy, it's because you have to learn something. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. I wish it was something specific, like, uh, sorry, I wish it was something specific, like I do yoga every morning, or (laughs) I do this, but I really, I really don't, I, it's just about making sure you put, you You have your intentions, yeah, yeah. and you have a good support system, right, and it's so important, people underestimate that, and and it's, it's like not, a lot of people think, well, I don't have it directly around me, but it's also something that you can acquire, right, and that, that's the whole purpose of, like, joining a mastermind or a support group or other yeah. a community of other entrepreneurs where you can go and get that support and get that motivation. Now, one thing that I want to ask you, a little bit of a more personal question, but if you could go back and you could meet Zaina right before she started Serial Box Agency. How many years have you guys been in operation right now? Two now. Two, mashallah, amazing. Inshallah, moving forward to 20. So <laughs> if you could go and meet Zainab from two years ago, uh, right as she's just about to get started on this journey, and you could tell her one thing, that she could hold on to throughout these two years of this roller, this roller coaster of a journey and hopefully the future, what would you go back and tell her? One thing that she could hold on to that would make the journey just a little bit easier for her. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's a really, really insightful question. I think I would tell her that I've always struggled in knowing where my professional, where I fit in professionally, because I was on this spectrum of 
helping brands sell products to helping raise money for kids. And I think I would tell her that in Cereal Box, you'll find your purpose and you'll find your place. And I think knowing knowing that 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 feeling of this is this is what I would like to dedicate my life to, or I'll find my ultimate purpose here, would be the the best thing I could say to myself to encourage myself to keep going. For sure. Now I know you mentioned one one part about routines. You're like I don't have a specific routine that I do, like yoga or whatever. But I do want to ask mm-hmm. you actually: Is there at least one thing that you can give us? Some old listening to this can walk away with and be like, all right, if I implement this thing, it's gonna help me be like one percent better, ten percent better. 10% more optimistic, more positive, uh, more hopeful in my journey through life. So for you, has there been a specific habit, a specific action that you generally go back to and in times where you're not feeling so good? I would say that time away from your desk is, is very, very valuable. A lot of times we can get cooped up behind our screens, processing numbers and data, whatever it is that we're doing. And we forget that there is actually a whole world beyond the screen that will support us and drive us and feel that creativity that has us all here today like listening to this mm-hmm. podcast so i think that would be the first thing like make time for stuff up beyond beyond the the business that you're you're running and, and how- i think prayer sorry yeah, <laughs> and no, the I was second say, thing is, yeah go ahead and the second thing I think is prayer I think Mm. with our cereal box offices we always make sure that uh, prayer time is even if it's like 10 or 15 minutes throughout your day that that time is reserved specifically for you and Allah and while it may seem cliche there is so much barakah in just having that 15 minutes to yourself 15 times a day between you and your Lord to again rectify your intentions make sure that you uh, you know what your what your your ultimate purpose is and why we're here and yeah 100% that's the only thing that gets us through tough times (laughs) for sure I can imagine and and I completely resonate with that and I wanted to ask you because you mentioned time away but a lot of people yeah like I think not all the time not every time away is equal like time away where we're just like kind of vegging out in front of tv might kind of bring us distraction but it might not necessarily elevate our consciousness or really refuel our batteries and a lot of times what actually people should aim to do is outside of the work that you're doing outside of the business that you're working on really to spending that quality time with quality people doing quality activities right and not necessarily on your own like watching tv sure that's okay yeah. but a lot of times you refuel so much better when you're out you know let's say for a hike with good friends that you appreciate right or um doing something and just having like a good moment a good moment of connection with someone that you enjoy or love right um and so i just wanted to kind of highlight that point in regards 100%. to 100 it's about ch- chasing that inspiration chasing that anything that fuels that creativity for me i can't be at the cereal box office every day because it's just not how my mind works jamal completely opposite he's there from like like 8 a.m to like god knows when so just chase whatever makes you the most productive mm-hmm. definitely what can we expect from you and from cereal box moving forward in the future Oh my god there's lots on the horizon for us so oh, mm-hmm. every day is a new conversation so what's really cool about this space is that it's a completely untapped market for young people um Jamal and I have noticed that usually we're the youngest in the room and most of the time I'm the only woman in the room too which is extra fun <laughs> so uh there's a lot of there's a lot, a lot of stuff we could do here we're currently working on building a SaaS product um mm-hmm. so you will hear more about that hopefully if you guys all you know stay connected to Cereal Box <laughs> and uh we've uh we're expanding our content creation process. We're streamlining a lot of our, of our processes. One cool thing that we're it's kind of in the works is um, we found that one of the biggest struggles for a lot of charities was producing content. And obviously it's very expensive to have a, a videographer, a photographer on the ground all the time. So we're trying to create an international network of videographers and photographers from all over the world as a way for them to make extra money as well, where they can like sign up to jobs and we can send them briefings to create content so that would be a really interesting and again, exciting project to work on awesome. um but yeah there's just so much i don't even know where to start <laughs> awesome Michelle, i love that there's so much that you guys have in the works and how can we stay connected to you and where should we tell people to go if they want to just learn more and kind of stay connected with what you're doing and even possibly work with you Cool. So our LinkedIn is pretty busy. So you're more than welcome to follow us on there. We've also got a mailing list on the Serial Box site. 
not just for like people who are trying to raise money for charity, but also to keep you connected to the kinds of things that are on the horizons for us as well. Um, you're also more than welcome to like check out our personal Instagrams as well. We don't really want run one for cereal box, but any but any insight into our lives or anything, you're more than welcome to follow us there too. Awesome. So we'll make sure to drop links for that. I'll ask you to send them to me and we'll drop them in the episode notes so that people can go and check them out, inshallah. For all of you listening to the podcast, you guys know the drill. Make sure to subscribe to the episode and podcast and check out the episode notes for the links for our guests. You can connect with them and we'll see you in the next episode, guys. Take care. Assalamu alaikum wa